you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to our theme verse that is 2 Timothy 3.16, as we're going through our history and our heritage. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And the 17th verse, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And as we remember from our second lesson on this, that phrase God breathed means God breathed out. So what we have in the scripture is God breathing out his word and will to our lives. And we're going to go into the fourth lesson on our heritage and history. And there's a lot of information here you are not going to have a quiz on all of this information. But what I want for you to have is to have that broad survey, that overview of our true Christian her heritage and history. You know, people ask me, okay, you're a preacher and you're a pastor but you seem to go into a lot of history and I say yeah because I started out as a historian first and then the theologian came along later and I think for me that was the right way to do it and there are a lot of times people will say you know I haven't heard any of this before if it's so true and if it's the true history of the church why haven't we heard it that's because a lot of theologians were really good on their theology but they haven't availed themselves of the history. And that doesn't make them wrong. That just makes them different than me. And it's okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to the time when we can expound upon verses of Scripture, when I can go through um, the Gospels with you together, when I can go through uh, the Pauline epistles together, and John and Peter and all of those uh, books of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well. Uh, but if we don't have our foundation down. You know, this building would not stand very well if it didn't have a firm foundation, if it didn't have a really, really good foundation. So your foundation is important, and it's important when you know about your heritage. So let's go into more of the integrity of the content of our Bibles. And we're going to go all the way back to A.D. 40 through A.D. 98. Somewhere during that time period, you have the New Testament autographs, the writers who are writing all of these books, and uh, Paul having written half of it or more than half of that whole New Testament. Now, I'm going to introduce an idea that some of you all may not know, but Bear with me, stay with me, it's not heresy, it's history. We know that Paul was let out of house arrest, imprisonment in Rome, in about the year A.D. 62. The next time that Paul shows up on our radar is in Colossae in mid to late 64 A.D., and most scholars believe that he had a fourth missionary journey during that time where he went to Spain. And he mentioned that he wanted to do that in his writings to us. So there's a period of time from 62 to 64 that Paul just drops off the radar. Now that's certainly plenty of time to go from Rome around Spain up to northern France and Britain. As a matter of fact, you can do that. You could do that by ship back in those days, and the Romans did it on a regular basis. In about four to five weeks, you can get all the way from Rome to England. And that's with stops. If you didn't stop at all because you were 
going to wage war or something, you could get there in three, three and a half weeks. So this is not a stretch that we're talking about here. So scholars believe that he went to Britain, northern France, and Spain during that fourth missionary journey. And this is just what I mentioned. He got out of house arrest and resurfaces in Turkey in 64 AD. Here's a saying from Clement who lived about 150 AD. This is Clement of Alexandria, not Clement of Rome, but uh, he wrote in about 150 AD and he said seven times Paul was in bonds. He was exiled. He was stoned. He was, herald, he was a herald both in the east and the west. He gained the noble fame of his faith. He taught justice to the whole world and when he had reached the limits of the west, he gave testimony before rulers. So what was the limit of the West back in those days? It really wasn't Spain. If you're talking about the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was ended at Hadrian's Wall, right, in England. And so uh, the limits of the West, as far as the Romans and writers of that day were concerned, was England. Then Capulus who did a history of the apostles back in the uh, writers of writing of antiquity says, I know scarcely of one author from the time of the fathers downward who does not maintain that St. Paul, after his liberation, preached in every country of the West, including Britain. And he, he wrote this in uh, the, uh, around uh, 800 AD. And so we have at least a dozen mentions in the writings of the church fathers about the fact that Paul went to northern France and Britain in between his two imprisonments. So I want you to just sort of shelve that because that's going to come back and be important later on when we talk about the church in Britain and how it got started and some of the things that happened there. And that is most of our heritage coming from that English-speaking area. And so if you'll shelf that, then in a couple more Sundays, we're going to really come right back to that and see how important that was for Paul back in his day to have gone to Britain. But here is Papyrus 1 or as they might call it, Papyrus 1, if I can get my speech out. Designated, it's an early copy of the New Testament in Greek, the Gospel of Matthew dating to the early 2nd century. It's currently housed at the University of Pennsylvania and was discovered at Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. So you could go to the, this very day, or at least tomorrow when the library is open, up to the University of Pennsylvania and see this. And it's from early 2nd century, that is about 110 to 125 A.D. This is another papyrus, the Rylands Papyrus P52. It's known as the St. John's Fragment. The style of the script is strongly Hadrianic, which would suggest a most probable date somewhere between 100 A.D. and 115 A.D. Why is all this important? When people say, oh, you know, that the Bible is just a put together, the church put that together hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus. And you can't depend on it. That's just the church leaders trying to feather their nest and trying to make up something about Jesus and Paul from hundreds and hundreds of years later. No, no, we're talking less than a hundred years. We're talking 70 years later we're finding that we have these things. And of course we mentioned last week the Chester Beatty papyri, but I wanted to put it back in so that we could understand. These were found in 1931, dated all of the entire corpus that was found between 100 AD and 300 AD. It's most of the Pauline corpus, much of the Old Testament, and substantial gospel fragments. The Chester Beatty discovery means the possibility of entire Bibles in book form in Greek with sacred abbreviations existed within 100 years after the Apostle John's death. The New Testament portions are quite possibly from the first book copies made only one generation from the original writing. 
This is exciting. This is uh, bolstering and encouraging our faith to say, wow, we have this. In the Chester Beatty Library, you, some of the Chester Beatty Library is in the University of Michigan Library. If you wanted to go up there, you could find it. The rest of it is in the Beatty Library in Dublin, Ireland. But he was an American. So, coming down to AD 100 to 200, you have the other original apostles, disciples, Paul's disciples and elders, John's disciples and the elders, Peter's disciples, Clement of Rome, Justin Martyr, and all the others, made commentaries, copies of the scriptures, and this was all between 100 and 200 AD. And then, I know this is getting pretty busy here, but look down at the bottom here, because all this is the same at the top. From A.D. 200 to 400, you have all of these writers that we have copious writings and um, mentions, quotations from the Old Testament, quotations from the New Testament about Jesus Christ and about the early church. So this is encouraging us right through from 200 to 400. But then also look at the archaeological evidence. And we'll just, we're just going to touch, scratch the surface of the archaeological evidence. But I wanted you to pay attention to it. All of these numbers that you see here, there are 17, by AD 250, there are 17 archaeological sites that have been dug and been notated that were at least AD 250 to AD 500 that are of Christian ancestry there. Many people in the church will say, well, you know, it wasn't until uh, 5 to 600 AD that they finally got up all the way to Great Britain. No, not at all. There was a church there that was strong and it was thriving, and we're going to actually see that when we go through it in subsequent Sundays. But look at all these others. 23 in France, 11 in Spain, and on and on. 52 is the winner uh, for, for count over in Turkey, where the original seven churches were. And so, all told, there are over 200 archaeological sites that tell us that the early, <coughs> excuse me, the early church was extant in the early centuries. And of course, these centers came to be centers of Christendom. You had a very large church organization up in Great Britain, northern France, of course Italy, northern Turkey, and then in the Antioch area and down in Alexandria. And these archaeological sites tell us they have pottery shards, they have uh, papyri, and all of these things let us know that there were Christian churches in the area as early as 250 AD. And a great little clue as to what we have in Paul and the uh, early church is that almost all of the archaeological sites in northern France and Germany are sites where Irish or English missionaries came from England to France. You know, most historians mistakenly say that the Christian movement came up from Rome through Italy into the Piedmont and then on up into Germany and across finally over into England. That is not the case. The history does not bear that out whatsoever. What happened was God caused an end around Rome and came and put his church here and then over here as well and the church then descended via missionaries into France and into Germany. And this, we're not going to read everything because you've, you've got copies of this, but I'm just going to just remind you, I'm going to read this first one and then we'll go pretty fast through the rest of them. Highlights only of the church fathers and their writings. 
There are 36,000 plus writings of the church fathers. We're talking about in the first 500 to 700 years of the church. Clement of Rome in 97 AD, this is when the Apostle John is still alive. He wrote 65 short chapters to the Corinthian church with 150 quotes from the Old Testament, an illustration of Christ's resurrection, reference to Paul's career, and chapters 42 and 40 through 44 compose a spiritual lineage of the men of Christ from the apostles and the apostles from Christ. So what he's doing in 97 AD is giving us a, a chain of custody of the belief in Christianity of the first two into the third generation beyond Christ. That's important that we have this information and we have it. And then Ignatius writes letters to the church um, for church unity and um, against the Gnostics and the Docetists. And um, then we have Polycarp, who was Bishop of Smyrna. He was, as a young man, the disciple of the Apostle John. And in 110 AD, he wrote letters which quote directly and indirectly from both the Old and New Testament. The Diadache. Now, some people call this the Didash, the Diadoc, or this all over the board. But supposedly, it's supposed to be called the Diadache. 125 AD. It's a manual of church instruction concerning the ethical actions consistent with a Christian life. We have copies of that. We have ancient copies of that. Justin Martyr in 150 AD wrote his apology. His apology letter number one, of which there were three, was in 67 chapters about Christian morals. The founder of Christianity is Jesus the Christ, told by the Hebrew prophets. So he does an entire commentary in 150 AD on the whole Bible. And then Papias gives us in 150 AD, he says something very interesting amongst all the things that he writes, that Mark was the interpreter of Peter. And Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew language. Now, isn't that interesting? Because only in the last century have we figured out that Mark was the amanuensis, the scribe, for Peter. So Mark's gospel is really Peter's gospel. And that we found ancient copies of Matthew in Hebrew. That was why Matthew uh, wrote in Hebrew first his gospel and then it was translated into Greek. Well, we just figured that out in the last century and Papias wrote it to us back in 150 AD. Tertullian in 200 AD writes about the nature of the Trinity, quoting the New Testament and comments on worldwide spread of Christianity. So. This is just scratching the surface. As I said, we've had, we have 36,000 documents and more that haven't even been actually studied. So we're going to start putting the picture together now. So you have all of these centers of Christianity in about 150 AD that are growing, that are having church members, that are having elders, that are having bishops, and then... The evil one does not rest. He had to get in to the growth, persecution, and spurious teachings. So you have these great centers of Christianity up in Britain and down here in Turkey and in the Mediterranean area around Antioch. And then you have these spurious teachings that start popping up. So what are some of those teachings? Gnosticism, Docetism, Cultism, Stoicism, Barbarism, all the isms started popping up to uh, split the church, to make the church members fight one another so that Jesus Christ couldn't be seen in their unity. About AD 200 is when those started really getting going well around the Mediterranean basin. Then you had 
the monophysites, the Pelagians, the Arians, and the Donatists that came up. You think we have trouble with denominations today? We don't have anything on these guys. Um, they started popping up, and these are the areas where they popped up, and you can go study all of that if you're like Ralph and you're brainiac like that. You can go do that. Um, but I'm, I'll, do, I'll do a survey for you. This is about 300 AD now. We're going through a thousand years of history in one sermon. You know, Rabbi Zacharias once said, text taken out of context becomes a pretext. Text taken out of context becomes a pretext. And what was happening was, people were cherry picking the things that they wanted to cherry pick and putting their own interpretation to it out of the Bible and it was becoming a pretext to the truth. And also, J.I. Packer, this is one of my favorites, he said a half-truth presented as the whole truth becomes a complete untruth. And that's what we have sometimes when we have teachers that want to push an agenda on, on us and they pick out, you know, and uh, please correct me if I ever try to do that. I need, I'll need to be humbled in that case. Uh, but we're not going to try to present half-truths as whole truths because then it becomes a complete untruth. You have to take the entire New Testament and all the things it says about a subject, all the things it says about a doctrine, and not one thing and try to bring it up to the fore to match your agenda. This is dangerous when you try to do that. As a matter of fact, in 380 AD we have a writing of Bishop Gregory of Nyasa, and he says, every part of the city is filled with such talk. The alleys, the crossroads, the squares, the avenues, it comes from those who sell clothes, money changers, grocers. If you ask a money changer what the exchange rate is, he will reply with a dissertation on the begotten and the unbegotten. If you inquire about the quality of the price of bread, the baker will reply, the father is greater and the son is subject to him. And so they're having this argument about God and Jesus Christ and what their relationship was and is. And we still have that today, don't we? The Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons tell us that Jesus was, is not a part of God. He's a creature of God. God created Jesus. as He's not part of the same essence of the triune God. We still have that today. And guess what? It's a little Greek word and a little Greek letter that makes a lot of difference. They were arguing the monophysites. The reason they're called monophysites is because they believed in one God and that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit were not a part of that. They were creatures of that. And so the Greek homoousion is the same substance. Homoousin is homoousin. Sorry, got my syllables in the wrong place. Um, is of like substance. It's the difference between he is God and he's like God. And have you ever heard that old saying, that, that saying, I don't care one iota for that? Anybody, anybody heard that? One iota? You know where that came from? One iota. That's the Greek letter iota. I. And so, if you don't care one iota for that, what you're saying is, you believe in the triune God. And so, let me show you this little thing that you may be wondering what it's here for. This is uh, a, a little glass that CJ and I got when we visited Germany. The Germans, um, particularly Lutherans, were very great at trying to get a, an iconic lesson together. And they built these uh, back in the uh, Reformation time. And what it shows is, as you can see, it's carved in the edges here. And the carving in the edge actually reflects something on the inside. I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are three of them. And 
One stands for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so what they said was, look, uh, God is one essence, just like this glass is one essence. You can't separate it. And you see it on the, you see it on the outside and you see it on the inside. It's all one essence, but it has three distinct sides that show you different sides of the essence of the likeness of the Father. That's a Trinity crystal. And so this was a great way for them to say, look, no, 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 it's not God and then he created Jesus and he created the Holy Spirit. He is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And that's what we believe as Protestants believe it, Catholics believe it. It is a standard for our Christian faith. The Trinity. So that's our little object lesson there. So now look at all these others popping up. I'm not even going to try to pronounce all of these. It was enough for me just to be able to type them in. But by AD 400, you had the church splitting into all of these different denominations and different arguings and different problems and agendas that were popping up. And that was a shame because now you had the rustics, they called the English the rustica, the common beasts of people that believed in true Christianity and then we sophisticated knew all of these uh, different intricacies of Christianity. So what happened? The Roman church at that time, and please let me reiterate, I believe that the Catholic church has done a fantastic, wonderful job in many things that it's done. I believe that Catholic people are wonderful people, and I have some in my own family who are of the Catholic faith. I'm not against that. What I'm cautioning us about is the hierarchies of any religion that come in and tell us that they're going to tell us what the Bible says rather than us Bible people telling us what the Bible says. So please forgive me for saying the Roman church. I don't mean it in a pejorative matter. I'm a historian. But the Pope came along and said, Dobbiamo Otiari Dio, which means we must help God. All of these people are getting it all wrong and they're splitting and they're causing factions and they're messing with our religion. So we're going to help God by bringing it all together under one roof. And what happened? There was a Roman power agenda that came along in here about helping God. And these were the centers of Mediterranean and historic Christianity at the time. These over in this area. And what happened was, by 500 AD, the power base and the economic base of the Roman system that was both church and state. You know, it was church and state. So you had to be a part of the church to be a part of the state. If you didn't, you couldn't eat. They absorbed the Alexandrian church and all that was in it into themselves by 600 AD. By 700 AD, they obliterated the Antiochian area church. And you can find this if you're willing to do the research. And by 800 AD, they dominated the church in Turkey to the point where it was all the same. And what happens when you come in and you say, we're all going to be the same. We're all going to do the same. We're all going to worship the same. We're all going to do econ economics the same. Then all of the people that were really believing, a lot of the things that they were believing said, I'm voting with my feet. I'm out of here. And they would just have to stay where they were because it was church and state, but they just didn't practice. They just weren't practicing very much anymore. They weren't reading the Bible. They didn't know what 
the realities of the Bible were. And so what happens when you create a vacuum? When you create a vacuum which was not created in these two areas, the mountains of Turkey and the mountains of Ireland, Scotland, and England, when you create that vacuum in all those places, those sophisticated places but there, what moved in? What, do you, what is this signal? What is this insignia? Islam. Islam moved in by 900 AD, you know, uh, Muhammad was doing his teachings and taking over all of Arabia in the mid 600s to late 600s. And then by 900 and 300 short years, 250 short years, whoops, they took over all of this whole area and were threatening. They got as far as the Pyrenees before they were stopped in Spain. And so Islam came in and took over all of what was historic Christendom in about AD 900. And then what was left? Well, you can start seeing it start to form and fashion. You have this line fashioning in Northern Europe where you have Christianity in the mountainous area outside of the big cities, outside of the areas of commerce that where the rustic church still lives. And that's our heritage. So there was this line of demarcation where the papal church and the Islamic church by 1000 AD are fighting one another for supremacy. And what they're saying is, we're the kingdom of God on earth fighting for God. And the Islamists are saying, we're the kingdom of God on earth fighting for God, that they called Allah, right? So, you have this clash. And the reason I bring this up is so many people paint us with the same brush. They say, hey, you Christians, you know, you Christians, you killed a lot of people in the name of God. You killed so many Muslims. You're still doing it today. You people can't can't call yourselves to be like Jesus. Well, guess what? We're not of that. Us, our heritage, the Anabaptist heritage, did not engage in the Crusades. It was only the, the established church of that day that engaged in all the Crusades. So you can honestly say, me and mine didn't engage in the Crusades. We were up worshiping God in Scotland and in England and in Ireland and in northern Germany and in northern France and that whole area in there. And so please don't ever let anybody talk to you like that and say that you as a Christian and your forefathers engaged in the Crusades. We did not. So next week, we're going to get into more of the integrity of the content. We're going to talk more about the true history. And you can see it already right now. It's starting to form up. And you can see the lines of embarkation. And you can see where everything is setting up. And that's going to be very important when we get to people like Martin Luther and William Tyndale and the other John Huss, the other leaders of the Reformed Church are going to come into play and it'll be on these, these lines of demarcation. And of course, there were other little points of light. There were points of light. There was still a little church in Rome. There was still a little true Christian church in different places in Turkey and in Constantinople. And the Lord has his church in many, many little places. But I'm giving you the big picture of how these things started to line up for true history and the true background of our Christian church. So I look forward to continuing with that next week, and I pray that you can be here as we go through the next few lessons that we'll do on this. Let me say to you that I believe each and every one of you all are teachers of the Word of God. And I, my job is to equip you to teach those that you influence. 
If there's something you don't like that I teach, just, you know, put that on the back burner and bring up the things I, that you do like that I teach that can encourage you and embolden you to witness for Christ. And then God will bless all that you influence. I see maybe 30, 35 people in this congregation today. But every one of you has probably 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, maybe even 100 people that follow your teaching in one way or another. That's a massive audience. I am so glad to be able to teach you and to be able to fellowship with you over these things of our history and our heritage. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your historians and your theologians that I merely stand on the shoulders of in order to bring these messages. But we see